What is going on YouTube? I am Lamont at large and today we are in Galveston, Texas walking alongside of the beach on this very nice day. It's about 83, 84 degrees. A little, little humid, not too much. It's actually, I would call this, at least for Galveston, a perfect day down here. You got a lot of people enjoying the weather. And today, well, we're going to talk about a little bit about the past of Galveston. Uh, going to talk about uh, a couple crimes that occurred out here. Uh, a brief uh, synopsis, synopsis, whatever that word is, of uh, how Galveston came to be. Kind of like a walking documentary, if you will, always at the scene of the crime, per se. So uh, without further ado, let's get right into this video. Galveston was originally settled by European settlers uh, in 1816. That is when the first documented note of any kind of buildings or structures, at least by settlers anyways, uh, was built. Uh, later on in 1836, Galveston was founded by Michael Menard, Samuel May Williams, and Thomas McKinney. Uh, it was briefly the capital of the Republic of Texas. That's when Texas was not a part of our nation. It was, the, you know, their own thing or what have you. Uh, originally in Texas, believe it or not, uh, this was the biggest city here in Texas. At the time, Houston, which is about 45 miles to the north, uh, they hadn't discovered that oil boom that would make Houston the biggest city in Texas in the very early 1900s but this was a very very important city why well look at the water out there you got the Gulf and uh, it's a port city and a lot of things were brought into this town now going into the Civil War uh, this was the scene of a major battle where the Confederacy ended up winning at the time, in 1863, right in the very beginning of, the Union was beating back the Confederates. They had taken over New Orleans and they were coming for Texas. Now, the Union, they came here, you know, blasted out of Galveston and drove the uh, Confederate soldiers back up to Houston. And then they mounted a comeback, if you will, brought some of their artillery came back out here and this is somewhere in this water over here this is where they had the battle of galveston bay now just by dumb luck uh, the only reason why the confederacy uh, was able to you know drive out the union soldiers was because the boats you know they didn't have radios back in those days so the boats the union boats they thought that a uh, union boat uh, which had ran aground out here was surrendering. In actuality, it ran aground, so they might not have known that, and the captain of that ship, instead of uh, the Confederacy gaining possession of that ship, uh, went ahead and just uh, dynamited it. But the explosion went off too early, and him, uh, and I believe along with some other men, don't quote me on that, but I know the captain definitely died on that ship. So the Confederacy demanded that the Union uh, troops surrender. So the rest of the boats, there might have been about another four Union boats, they said to hell with this. So they sailed away. They went back to New Orleans and Galveston would remain in the Confederacy control for the duration of the Civil War. The beach right here is also the scene of a very, very tragic event that occurred in September of 1900. And that, of course, is the great uh, Galveston hurricane. Uh, Galveston, at the time, you had about uh, 35,000 residents or so. Again, it is the largest city in Texas. So back in the, you know, late 1800s going into the early 1900s we didn't have radar we didn't have the weatherman we didn't have the internet or television 
uh, we didn't even have radio. So if a storm was coming from behind me over here, the only way the residents of Galveston would know that a storm was coming was when the boats would come to port and then they would tell anybody, the longshoremen that were working at the time, they would say, hey, there's a storm. It might be coming over here. Or they had telegraph. Telegraph, you know, they would send a message from, let's say, the Bahamas or Cuba or whatever. And then the message would get sent uh, to Florida and all these states along the Gulf of Mexico saying that there's a storm. Now on September 8th, 1900, a very huge storm, which ended up being the worst natural disaster in United States history uh, took place right here. One fifth of the residents of Galveston, about seven to eight, maybe 9,000 people died in this terrible, terrible hurricane. And one of the biggest tragedies was a orphanage that was right here along the beach. Uh, tell you a little bit about that story. Now, at that time, between the end of August of 1900 and the ensuing weeks leading up to the storm on September 8th, 1900, some people out here, they knew a storm was coming. You know, there was telegraphs being sent from Florida, going to Mississippi, coming over here. But it's kind of like the whole tornado thing. They weren't really worried about it. And at that time, you see, this is Seawall Boulevard. And you see that wall right here. Well, at that time, that wasn't there. So this ground would have been lower over here. And there is an orphanage right here that was ran by some nuns. Originally, their orphanage was a few miles in that direction. It used to be at a hospital, but then you had the yellow fever epidemic that a lot of people died in. So they ended up uh, securing enough funds to build an orphanage right out here on the beach right where i'm standing currently right now they get the kids away from the sick people and of course you know back in those days and maybe till these days uh, the beach um it, it, it meant uh, uh health and well-being so maybe uh, people back then believed that the ocean carried some kind of a mystique if you will uh maybe some fresh air would would cure whatever ails you so on that day, you had some nuns, about 10 of them, that were at the orphanage. And by this time, word is spreading around that there's a, there's a big storm coming. And it's getting windy. There is 10 foot waves. Can you imagine a 10 foot wave just coming at you right now? And this place is rocking, if you will. It's already too late. There is no way that they're gonna be able to get these kids out far away as, as quickly as they can. So the poor nuns, the only thing that they can think of to save themselves and the children was to tie all of the children together with some kind of a rope or what have you in groups of 10. They all tied themselves together and they just waited. They waited out the storm, but Little did they know how bad that storm was going to be. And like I said, these waves, 8 to 10, even 12 feet are just coming. Can you absolutely imagine all of this water? 145 mile an hour winds pushing immense amounts, volumes of water into the city streets. I mean, every single building in this town was at least damaged by the storm or just ultimately destroyed uh, again uh, can you imagine being there at that time the 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 agony and and all the death and all of the bodies i mean we think that hurricane katrina was bad in that hurricane about a thousand people died can you imagine eight times more people without the technology that we had to warn people to stay away from this area. Lots of people lost their lives on that day. And I tell you what, when that happened, it's estimated that the amount of damage 
that happened in this area was about $35,000 worth. Now, $35,000 in 1900, uh, we're talking about today's dollar, about $1.23 billion, billion would it be. That's a lot of money. Everyone's home had some kind of damage. Uh, mothers and, and fathers and, and brothers and sisters, everybody was torn. You had no way of calling one person to say, hey, uh, where's Ralph? Hey, where's Timmy? Hey, where's Gertrude at? And the amazing thing about such death and destruction that occurred on that day is the rebuilt effort that it took to rebuild this city back into what it was, if not better. What I'm walking on right now, which is the seawall, was built using uh, granite boulders. Guys, the uh, American ingenuity and the work ethic it took to rebuild this whole entire town, in my opinion, is quite impressive. Can you guys imagine, can you guys imagine moving tons of sand, boulders from here all the way up, building an 18 foot, in some sections, not every section, but in some sections, an 18 foot wall. We didn't have any uh, <laughs> bulldozers we didn't have any backhoes there was no construction equipment this feat was done by no other than human will strength ingenuity and determination horse can you imagine just horses like a hundred horses with uh with pull wagons being loaded with sand and rocks and whatever and moving those huge giant granite stone slash boulders to build this wall i mean they created a six mile long wall at least 10 feet tall some sections again 18 feet uh that that was paid for because i don't know how exactly they did it but they raised about fifty thousand dollars towards the cost of paying the laborers and everybody to come out here to rebuild this area. And uh, this marker right here uh, is for the uh, original site. Uh, they called it St. Mary's Orphan Asylum. They also, there was another name for it too, but that was, I believe, I guess the, the main name. Incredible, absolutely incredible. It's, it's one thing, you know, that's why I love doing these videos. It's one thing to read about it or to watch it on youtube or on television but it's another thing to realize that over this huge stretch of land over 120 years ago hundreds and thousands and thousands of people came to galveston to help their fellow man and woman clean up uh, what nature destroyed so we're gonna move a little bit forward in time uh, we're going to talk about the development of Galveston and where it uh, ended up from then on looks like that cruise ship is about to take off party is on that boat no party where I'm at it's funny that the next man we're about to talk about is the patriarch of that name on that building right there his name is Salvatore Maceo so we're gonna go back to right after the hurricane, right? Right after the hurricane and the city's rebuilt. Everything is as back to normal as it could possibly be. Now, by that time, you had a lot of people having to rebuild their businesses and you had a lot of people wanting to go 40, 45 miles up north to Houston. A man by the name of Howard Hughes he has just developed a drill that uh, is capable of drilling in places that other drills couldn't drill in before. So they need to hire a lot more people to work over in the oil fields over up in Houston. So some people stayed, some people left. And around 1910, 
a man and his brother, they come to Galveston to set up shop. They're going to start a business. His name was Salvatore Maceo. He was originally born in Sicily on March 1st, 1894. Him and his family, they immigrated to the United States and he ends up coming to Louisiana. They stayed there for a while and then they moved to Galveston. Now, originally uh, by trade, he was a barber. Now him and his brother, they come and start a business here. Everything's going fine. And then of course, prohibition comes through and now there's no alcohol to be had or to be bought or sold, at least unless you do it the old fashioned way, which was via the underground, buying and selling without the uh, law knowing what you're doing. So in those days in Galveston on the port, you would have these ships just full of alcohol coming from Cuba. They're coming from the Bahamas. Uh, they're, they're coming from uh, wherever. They're coming off maybe about a few miles offshore, three, three two o'clock in the morning, whatever. And then the, the little bootleggers boats <laughs> would come rowing or whatever out to the ship, uh, unload some of the cargo and bring it back over here. So Sam, who was Salvatore, he went by the American name of Sam, and that's what everybody knew him as. A lot of times immigrants wouldn't come over here, they would change their names or switch their names to an American version of it. So he would, you know, buy some of this uh, liquor or whatever, or maybe he made it his self. He had wine, he had liquor, and his uh, people that would do business with him as gifts, he would give them, you know, a bottle of wine, hey, here, you know, here's a sip of rum or, or whatever. And, you know, these guys can't get enough because they don't know where else to find it. So he starts thinking to himself, man, you know, I really, I really should, you know, blow this burger and, and just, you know, get into the bootlegging business because that's where the money is at is in bootlegging. So later on, he would hook up with a local gangster named Ollie Quinn. And together, they would make a, or open up a speakeasy in town. Now, there was something about uh, Sam Maceo that people loved. Uh, they had a nickname for him. They called him the Velvet Glove. But others would call him the Velvet Hammer. This guy was very suave, very smooth sophisticated you ever met one of those guys that it doesn't matter who they are they're just a people person and people just tend to gravitate towards them well that's who this guy was sam and his brother rose their barbershop was a perfect front for offloading their booze i mean they were making pretty good money actually it was a little bit more than pretty good they were making a whole lot of money they were rolling in the dough they were making so much money that you know Sam tells his brother, he said, hey, listen, how about we start a legitimate business? Because we got so much money, it's going to look really bad if we're driving around in nice cars or whatever, and we own a barbershop. Kind of weird, right? So in 1926, they open up the Hollywood Dinner Club, um, and they could not have been <laughs> the most successful businessmen of all times. I mean, you have Prohibition America, you have uh, the Hollywood Dinner Club. Uh, you got uh, traveling acts coming in to perform. And also, we have some booze in the back. Booze in the back, kids. That was a place, shh. You go over in there, order dinner, get some drinks, and go in the other back room, gamble a little bit. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention, of course, illegal gambling. They're making even more money. Come on in the back, kids. Let's, Let's play some cards, play that roulette wheel, whatever it is that they're doing. Oh, and also there's another, another back room. Yeah, that's where prostitution is going down. Something going down anyways. So you have Sam and Rose Mateo, Maceo, excuse me. They're selling liquor. They're got their illegal gambling and they got their prostitution uh and boy there was a lot of prostitutes here in galveston texas let me tell you at the time this was the capital of prostitution in america there was more prostitutes per capita here 
than there was in any other part of the country. As the insane chef would say, them's a whole lot of prostitutes. I mean, you talk about prostitutes. All right, I don't know how many more times I'm gonna say that, but it is what it is. So everything is going good. The police, yeah, they know about Sam, Sammy, whatever they wanna call him. They know what he's doing, but uh, you know, the uh, local beat cop walking down the street, making sure everything is going good, smooth. Uh, he's getting a little, a little kickback. Listen, you know, I'm a businessman. You know, here's here's a here's a hundred bucks. Uh, you know, take your kids to, you know, whatever Disneyland, whatever they had back then. And he starts paying the uh, the local beat cop, and then he started paying the you know local politicians in the area. But it wasn't like he was paying them and then they would just, you know, like, I uh, just ignore them. Some people would not ignore the illegal happenings that were, you know, or the rumblings that were going on in this city. But remember, like I said, they called him the Velvet Glove. Like, this guy was a nice guy. So, yeah, it helps when you're getting your palms greased with $100 bills or $50 bills or whatever he's giving you. But when they like you, and maybe not all the police officers like you, but most of them do you know they're telling them hey they're thinking about raiding your club you might want to you know shut down the prostitutes and the, i told you i was gonna probably say that again i was thinking about my head and you better you better shutter the gambling operations and that's what he would do so they would bust um him in the at the hollywood dinner club he also had another place along the pier called the balinese room so yeah two places this guy sam was well loved uh he he was like almost like the king of Galveston, if you will. Uh, they had a nickname for the, you know, the city in which he controlled. It was called like the, the free state of Galveston, something like that. He was very, very well loved, very, very well received in the community. And uh, through the, you know, the 20s going into the very early, very, very early 30s, uh, everything was going smoothly well until about 1931 uh this stupid state uh, it's about a thousand thousand four hundred miles away from here it's a little state called nevada well they legalized gambling uh oh here we go legalized gambling and that would ultimately prove to be the end of sam maceo's uh syndicate if you will whether you believe that Sam Maceo was a gangster or just a very shrewd businessman, uh, you can't take away the fact that this guy has helped out quite a bit of people back in those days uh, in Galveston. Uh, there was a local uh, car dealership that was going out of business and uh, this guy has so much money. He goes to the car dealership and buys practically all of their vehicles. And what does he do with all these vehicles? He gives them out to every single priest that lived in and around Galveston. There was also a black church somewhere in the area that was about to close down. The reason why was because their roof was in repair or in need of repair and they didn't have any money to fix it. And it got to the point where, you know, when it would rain, it would leak really, really badly and things were not looking good for that church. So one morning the, uh, reverend or the deacon of the church he shows up for work at his office and he he sees like 12 15 people like on top of the roof and he's saying like what what's going on here what are you guys doing he said uh we came here to fix your roof he's like, what are you talking about i don't have any money to pay you I, I didn't order anybody to come fix the roof he said compliments of sam maceo and they went and re repaired and fixed that man's roof Ain't that right, boy or girl? You're just chilling, huh? It's kind of hot, right? I can never just see a cat and ignore it. You're messing up my video right now. You want some food? I got some chicken. I'll come back and give you some in a little bit, all right? Yeah, I'll be back. So, Sam Maceo, uh, to me, you know, definitely not a gangster. You know, mafiosi, eh, I don't know, depending on what you think that is. But uh, he did quite a few, quite a, a lot of good things in uh, Galveston. Probably paid for a good amount of the uh, politicians and law enforcement officers' kids' college funds. Maybe uh, he paid for a lot of their vacations or what have you. 
So later after uh, setting up shop at a desert inn, uh, Sam, he ended up getting sick and dying of cancer in 1951. He's buried at the Galveston Memorial Park. Uh, so in a future video, we're going to go visit his grave. But uh, Sam Maceo just... Uh, not really a dark side of Galveston. He's just a man that uh, I read a little bit about, and uh, he he earned my respect of uh, you know bringing a town or a city that had you know maybe had kind of fallen in on hard times, and he brought some life to it because even though it was illegal, he did bring people from in and around the entire country here to spend money, revitalizing Galveston's economy. Hey, I see you're in the shade now. Yeah, I got you some chicken for you and your friend. All right, I'm going to put it by the trash can. And then you guys are going to... told you I was going to come back. <sighs> there you go, it's right there. So you guys, you guys got to share, okay? It's right there. It's right there. Listen, I, I got to get going. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. All right, that ain't bad, it's chicken, huh. Told you I was gonna come back. All right, I'll leave you two alone. Okay, so, of course I was gonna go back and feed the cat. what are you guys, crazy? So anyways, so we're gonna go from a guy who, uh, was very beloved in Galveston and very well respected to a another guy who was not liked and not respected and is or was an absolute homicidal maniac. I was on my way to the next location in the video and I seen this roadside memorial right here which is right across the street from Ball High School and as you can see there's some pictures of the memorial that it was made for and that was for 14 year old mason nelson this kid just started high school probably not even a few weeks last year 14 years old just started high school he's riding with a few of his friends in a jeep and this loser comes from this street right here probably driving 50 60 miles an hour and crashes right into them right here where I'm standing. Mason was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. The idiot who hit and killed him, 28-year-old Keith Brazier. Let me tell you about this idiot, Keith Brazier. He has three prior DWI arrests, one from 2016, one from 2019, and one from, I believe, 2021, where he went to prison. He just got out of prison and got on parole not even a few hours before he hit and killed this kid. A few hours. How the hell did that happen? How, the, how did you let this guy, this guy has three DWIs and you let him out of prison? He didn't even serve much time and he kills this kid 14 years old look at that that is ah stuff like that makes me sick yeah rest in peace of that kid that's terrible that is absolutely sick ah well right now Keith Brazier more than likely he's probably got his parole revoked and he's in jail or prison right now i think he has a five hundred thousand dollar bail but that's insane because even if they paid the bail his bond is going to get revoked so i don't even know why they gave him a bail and just by just by dumb luck it happened right across the street from the school where he went to and this is the same high school where debbie ackerman and maria johnson used to go to in the 70s uh they were uh found dead in the killing fields i did a video kind of showing the locations of the killing fields uh 20 some odd women killed over a stretch of about uh, 30 years or so nobody really knows if it was the work of one man or a few it's probably more likely than a few though 
So if anybody wants to see that video, I'll put the link in the uh, description box below and I'll pin it in the comments. When you see an empty beer can in the middle of the street, that lets me know that this is a good neighborhood. Not a good neighborhood to raise a family in, no, a good neighborhood for me to do a story in because more than likely, there's gonna be a lot of crimes taking place. In this neighborhood once used to live a man by the name of Robert Durst. You probably might know this man's name or at least recognize his face. Uh, he has been all over the media and the news. There was a documentary made about him called The Jinx. Uh, I'll get a, into a little bit of that story. Uh, this guy's story could easily be made into a one hour vlog with me, but we're going to condense uh, that down to about 15 minutes. I'll give you a brief rundown of exactly who this nutcase is. Robert Durst was born April 12th, 1943 in New York. Uh, he comes from an insanely wealthy family known as the Durst family, the Durst Corporation. These guys have a lot of money. The family is worth over $8 billion. They own so much land in lower Manhattan and Philadelphia. They own one-tenth of the World Trade Center. Big, big family, major, major holdings. Uh, this family has had money for over a century. This is the kind of family, they have so much money that if, you're, if you have a business and they raise your rent to $25,000 a month and you can't pay it, you're forced to leave, and they could afford to let that building be empty for the next five years. They don't care. That's how much money these guys have. A young Robert Durst at 10 years old is already showing signs of mental illness and schizophrenia. This guy has more than a few marbles loose. So going into the late 60s, early 70s, Robert Durst does not want to be bothered with the family business. All right. He doesn't want to bother with it. He doesn't want to deal with any real estate. He doesn't want to do anything with buildings. He wants to move up to Vermont and start a health food business called All Good Things. Got to remember that name, All Good Things, because later on a movie starring Ryan Gosling would be made in that same title. So this guy moves up to Vermont. He has his little business or whatever, living his little hippie life probably in Vermont there. And he would come back and forth between New York and uh, Vermont every now and then. So one day he's in New York and he meets a dental hygienist by the name of Kathleen McCormick. Uh, he's smitten with her, she's smitten with him. Oh, hey, by the way, baby, I'm rich. Okay, that's a pretty good pickup line if you ask me. So they start dating and I'm pretty sure this guy is laying it thick on her. Oh, my family's the Durst, we own that building, we own this building, we own that building schmoozing her whatever you call it after only dating for a couple weeks he convinces her to move with him up to vermont she quits her job they go up to vermont everything is okay i'm guessing and then one of robert's family members maybe his uncle comes up to vermont and convinces him to come back to new york and get involved in the family business so he tells Kathleen, hey, do you want to move back to New York? I'll, you know, get a job or I'll do something and, you know, you can go to school. Kathleen wanted to be a pediatrician. They moved back to New York and she enrolls in school. So she's in her fourth year, her last year, and things are not going good because his mental illness is progressing at a rapid pace. And... Kathleen's friends are starting to notice that, you know, every now and then she has like a bruise on her neck, on her arms, on her face. Uh, one night, her friends, because these are rich people, so they're very ritzy people. They do rich people things, have dinner parties, cocktail parties, whatever. And she shows up to the one of the parties wearing red sweats. Now, this is not like Kathleen because she is the wife of a multimillionaire who's worth over, you know, a billion dollars. She doesn't dress like that. She's dressed down. She looks very distraught. They notice that she has some marks on her face. One of her, uh, one of her friends, excuse me, pulls her into the side. And she's going, what's going on with you? 
Now, supposedly she said, you know, Robert's been putting his hands on me. Uh, I told him I want a divorce and I want a $250,000 settlement. So she tells her friend in confidence that not only did he say that there's going to be no divorce, that he's not giving her a dime and that he will stop footing the bill for her college education. Well, in 1982, Kathleen disappears. Now, she has been missing now for over 40 years. Uh, Robert Durst, as of now, he is responsible or, you know, everyone, police including, feel that he is responsible for her disappearance. Supposedly, he has said in interviews that the last time he's seen her, he dropped her off at a train station somewhere in New York, maybe Long Island, something I don't know. We will probably get more in depth on that story in a later video when I get to New York. So you got a missing wife. He doesn't know where she's at. Eventually her family, I believe they tried to sue the Durst family for wrongful death and they had her, you know, declared legally dead. I want to say uh, probably about six or seven years ago. So we're going to fast forward about uh, 30 some odd years later. So Robert Durst of all places ends up in Galveston, Texas. Now this guy, again, mental, mentally ill, this guy is also wanted in question for the murder of his friend, Susan Berman. That's another story that we might do at a later date in time. So this guy more than likely probably has two bodies on his you know on his record so to speak so this guy of all places moves to this very neighborhood and for some unknown reason maybe his paranoia maybe he thinks people are following him this guy is living his life as a woman in this very neighborhood but not just any woman a deaf mute woman or just a mute woman. Maybe his shtick is that he can hear, but he just can't speak. So his neighbors, they see this woman that's obviously a guy and he can only communicate by writing on a piece of paper. So he, this guy by now has about $60 million in the bank. He had sued his family successfully for uh, his inheritance because they disowned him after the whole debacle with his wife and him just going further and further into uh, mental illness. So they either a judgment was made for him or the family settled with him. They gave him $65 million. They said, okay, shut up. Just get away from us. You're insane. You're crazy. We want nothing to do with you. So this guy now, he has $65 million <laughs> What do you do when you have $65 million? Well, you come to a low-end part of Galveston and you rent a room in somebody's house. So this guy rents a room in somebody's house and he has a neighbor by the name of Morris Black. Now, him and Morris Black didn't see eye to eye. And so much, in fact, that they didn't see eye to eye that uh, Robert Durst ends up pulling out a gun, shooting and killing uh, Morris Black. Now, you're a mute, deaf woman, whatever your shtick is, probably one of the ugliest women you'd ever want to see, and you just killed your neighbor. So you got $60 million in the bank, you just killed your neighbor, you're, you're dressing up as a woman, you can't talk to anybody, so you communicate by writing on paper, so what do you do now? Well, you gotta get rid of the body. Well, that's, that's apparent. So this guy proceeds to dismember this poor soul. Arm, arm, leg, leg, head, torso, whatever. And he wraps them up in these uh, black trash bags. And uh, he proceeds to dump them uh, in, a, uh, in a bay somewhere around in this very, very area. And I believe the house where this occurred, I believe it's this one right, it should be this one right here. This is, yeah, 
I want to say I can't see the address. No, that is not it. It's one of these houses. Yes, this is in fact the house. This is what I thought it was. Uh, they changed the address online. It still shows 2213, but uh, this is where Robert Durst used to live. This is where the murder uh, was committed. And eventually Robert was arrested and tried for his murder. And after I believe about five days of deliberations, the jury found him not guilty. <laughs> And, you know, the uh, prosecution's theory on why he uh, murdered uh, this man was because they believe he was trying to steal his identity, steal his driver's license. I mean, what does a man do dressing up as a woman, saying that he's a mute, has uh, advanced stages of schizophrenia, is obviously not taking his medication, has $65 million in the bank. What are you doing? But uh, little do people know in this this little neighborhood with all these little uh, cutesy houses and homes that a brutal murder occurred in that home right there. The final story takes place right at this gas station, this Texaco right in front of me across the street. About... 40 years ago, that was a 7-Eleven. And the Wen family used to work there. The father, Wen Din Wen, who immigrated from Vietnam, managed that gasoline station. And he had his son, Tuan Wen, working there. Tuan was a student here in Galveston. He was an honor student, 16 years of age, working part-time at a 7-Eleven with his pops. On June 8th, 1980, around 11 o'clock at night, they're stocking cigarettes behind the counter. This human disease piece of vermin, one Harold Amos Bernard, he comes into this gas station with a friend, Regina Howard. They had previously met a few days ago, both losers, both trying to figure, hey, how can we make some money? Oh, I know, I got a gun, let's go rob somebody. So these guys are drinking, smoking dope, just twacked out of their minds. They come to this gas station to rob it. So Harold walks to the counter. He has a Coca-Cola can in his hand. He puts it on the counter. He tells him, hey, give me a pack of cool 100s. So when turns around, grabs the cigarettes, turns back around to hand it to him, and he sees a sawed off 22 caliber rifle staring right in front of his face. He said, give me all the money in the register. And I mean it. So he grabs a plastic bag, takes all of the money out of the register and hands it over to Harold. Without any kind of provocation, without any, anything, they gave him the money this guy shoots when turns around and shoots his son right in the chest. Both father and son died at the scene. There was a man who was coming in to buy something and he walked in on the robbery. And that stupid idiot woman yells at Harold when she, when she sees the witness to get him. So the witness runs out, flees the area, and calls the police. About 30 minutes later, with the description of the vehicle, four people are pulled over in a car on the I-45 northbound on the way to Houston. It was Harold Amos Bernard, he's the man that killed those people, Regina Howard, her husband, Murray Howard, and James O'Brien. Just four losers that met at a bar somewhere in Galveston. They're all drunk, being being lame. Just, how can we get some money? By robbing a 7-Eleven, killing two people, and not even getting the money. Now eventually, Harold Amos Bernard was found guilty of double murder, and on February 2nd, 1994, was executed in uh, Texas 
uh, electric chair. The other three idiots, they all pled to aggravated robbery. They received around each about 10, 10 to 12, 15 years. And then they were all eventually paroled. I think all of them pretty much got out around 1985 or 1986. The Wen family immigrated here from Vietnam, coming here, want a better life for their children. Working hard. Their son is an honor student. Just working at a gas station, they ain't making very much money. Both of them killed for absolutely no reason. These were only but many, many stories that have emanated in and around Galveston. I've only told a couple. There are more stories that I wanted to include in this video, but I'll probably later on do them as separate vlogs. All right, guys, I am out of here. The sun is gone. The night is only beginning for all of the tourists here in Galveston, so I'm going to make a hasty retreat and probably go find uh, some place to hide or whatever. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video uh, as much as I did making it. I will see you on the next vlog. Have a good one, guys. Be blessed. Be safe out there. Peace out.